Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, I am McKenna from Murder by the Book in Houston, Texas. And we are back today with another virtual event. Today we'll be talking with Christina McDonald and Mary Kubica, who are gonna be in conversation. And I will be coming on later to um, moderate any questions that you might have in the, in the comments. But before we get started with that, I'd like to mention a few things. Number one, we're open. We keep saying that. I know it sounds like a broken record at this point, but we've actually been open since October. You're welcome to come into the store with a mask. We're there Monday through Saturday, 10 to 6, and we would love to see you. Um, we also have um, several, we had lots of events this week. We have um, Don Bentley in conversation with Nick Petrie tonight. Um, tomorrow we'll be back with Natasha Preston, Holly Jackson, and Karen McManus, as well as um, Simon Turney, Gordon Doherty, and Kate Quinn. So lots of authors in the next 24 hours, and we hope that you'll be able to tune in um, for those. I should mention before we uh, move forward that we do have signed book plates for Christina McDonald's book, Do No Harm. We have some of those uh, still available, and I'm dropping a link in the comments right now, both on Facebook and YouTube. If you'd like to order, the link is right there. Um, okay, one last thing. So. We also have a pretty cool subscription box, Murder by the Box, that started at the beginning of the year. It's got three different plans, Best of the Month, Cozy Corner, and um, Crime Fiction Legends. And um, people have been enjoying those. So if you'd like more information about that, uh, it's a book delivered to your home once a month. And you can visit murderbythebox.com. Again, as I said, if you have any questions, you can put those in the comments. If you're on YouTube, put them in the live chat. On Facebook, put them right here in the comments and I'll get to them later. All right, now for the authors who are joining us today. Christina McDonald, hello. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Thank us for being here and thanks for being so gracious about rescheduling after the storm. I was uh, sad oh, to <laughs> think we were gonna miss this. Um, so I'm glad this worked out. Um, many of the people watching will already be familiar with you, but I'm going to go ahead and um, do your introduction right now. Christina okay. McDonald is the USA Today bestselling author of Behind Every Lie and The Night Olivia Fell, which has been optioned for television by a major Hollywood studio. Originally from Seattle, Washington, she now lives in London, England with her husband, two sons, and their dog, Tango. And as I mentioned, your newest mm -hmm. book is Do No Harm, and we do have signed book plates for it. Thank you again mm -hmm. for being here. Yeah, Yay! <laughs> All right, we also are joined by Mary Kubica. Hello. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, I am excited that you're here as well, and I'm doubly excited that you two ladies are going to be in conversation. It makes such a good job for me. <laughs> um, so, again, most people will know who you are, but just to run down your intro real quick, Mary Kubica is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of The Good Girl and Pretty Baby. She holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Miami University in Oxford, Ohio in history and American literature. She lives outside of Chicago with her husband and two children and enjoys photography, gardening, and caring for the animals at the local shelter. And I know that you don't have a brand new release right now, but um, you have Local Woman Missing coming in May, right? Correct. Excellent. So again, we've got um, links for that if you'd like to pre-order. Um, it's the same link that I dropped in there for um, Do No Harm. Okay, so I'm going to go away. I'm going to sit back and enjoy your chat, and you just call me back when you're ready to do crowd questions. Have fun. Thank you. Well, I'm so excited to be here with you, Christina. I oh, am such an honor. Devoured this book. I don't know about you or anybody that's out there watching, but I've been struggling to read a little bit during COVID. I just find that my attention is, you know, all over the place, and it's it's hard to find a quiet minute in the house with with yeah. everybody. But the minute I opened this book, Christina, I was like captivated. I mean, I, oh. I read the whole thing in maybe 48 hours. I just literally couldn't put it down, and it was one of those books that. Um, when I wasn't reading it, I was thinking about it and I was just so eager to get back to it, to just carve out some time in the day to get back to it. And your readers, if, if you haven't already picked up a copy or read it, make sure you do because you are going to love this book as much as I did. I'm absolutely sure. 
Um, so I wanted to start just a little bit with some of the incredible quotes that you have gotten for this book, because I'm not the only one out here praising it. You've you got so many quotes. And when I was looking at them in preparation for this, I had to just just pick a couple because there were so many. But I mean, you have received such high praise. Well deserved. Very, very, lucky, very blessed. <laughs> But let's see, this is from Sarah Pekinen, New York Times bestselling author of The Wife Between Us and You Are Not Alone. She says, gripping and unflinching, do no harm, explore, explores the ferocity of a mother's love and shows in heartbreaking detail how she'll risk everything to save her child. And Real Simple says, do no harm by Christina McDonald is an intense emotional page turner that's impossible not to devour in one sitting. I completely agree. <laughs> um, <laughs> Lisa Unger, New York Times bestselling author of Confessions on the 745 says, do no harm is a pulse pounding deep dive into the dark heart of addiction. The stakes couldn't be higher in the smart, breathlessly paced and emotional novel about love, family, and how far we'll go when our child's life hangs in the balance riveting, ripped from the headlines, and not to be missed. And I feel like she got it spot on. It's just all of that and more. So um, I'm so excited to be able to like pick your brain about this book a little bit more and just about writing in general and all of that today. Yeah. Um, so to start, um, I just was going to, I wanted, to, I thought maybe you could put in your own words a little bit what this book is about. Yeah, absolutely. So do No Harm is about a doctor, Dr. Emma Sweeney, who receives a diagnosis for her son that her son has a really rare form of leukemia and um, desperate to save his life and to do whatever it takes to make sure that he lives. She makes the very risky decision to start selling opioids in order to fund his life-saving treatment. But of course, things go wrong and somebody does end up dead and the person who ends up investigating that murder, that death, um, is the town's lead detective, and that is her very own husband. So it kind of ends up being a cat and mouse game between husband and wife. And really, at the end of the day, it, it's it's her son's life is on the line. And throughout all of these things that she's doing, which get incredibly wrong, you know, you, there's no way else to explain it. She gets worse and worse. You do have to kind of ask. And she has to ask herself, do the ends justify the means? Because she is a desperate mother and she is trying to save her son, but she's doing these things amidst, you know, the opioid crisis, the opioid epidemic. And so how how far is she willing to go? How, how far would you be willing to go? So it asks all these questions. And at the end, hopefully the reader will will decide. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. There's like this huge moral dilemma here. And yeah. it's one of the things that, you know, we can think, well, I, I wouldn't do that. Or maybe she's going too far. But then you don't know yeah. until you are in that situation. And like you say, your own child's life is hanging in the balance. Yeah. And you're the only thing to, you know, to save your child. You don't know what you would do. You know, you have no way yeah. until you're in that situation. So it's just, it's, it just, it's, you know, it's so emotionally moving, but so intense. There is, there's this point. Yeah. <laughs> Let me see what happens. But in <laughs> my health care, page 98, my mouth just dropped. You know, I thought, <laughs> okay, I'm going to put that <laughs> <laughs> And so, oh my goodness, people will not be able to put this down. Um, so the first thing right out of the gate that I saw that was your dedication to your brother, Daniel, which reads for being more than a statistic and for being strong. And so I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about Daniel and just the impact that he had on this novel. Yeah. So Daniel is my brother, my older brother. And a lot of the reason why I wanted to set this this book in particular against the backdrop of the opioid epidemic is because I watched him struggle with addiction for most of my adult life. And of course, when you watch somebody that you love go to war with themselves day after day after day, it, it has an impact. And it's, it's changed my opinions and my thoughts about addiction and about the opioid epidemic has changed a lot. It's in, in me, it profoundly changed me as a person. So I've had this kind of thought in my head for a long time that I wanted to set a thriller because I like, at the end of the day, I'm writing a, a fiction book. It's not real, right? Like, but I, it's a thriller. I wanted it to be exciting and interesting and, you know, maybe give people an escape from just daily life. Um, but I wanted to set it against the backdrop of the opioid epidemic because it is personal to me. You know, what my brother has struggled with is personal to me. Um, and just, just to clarify, I have discussed with my brother that, you know, I would talk about this and he's given me the okay. I've had that question a few times, but, um, 
you know, so I've, I have a lot of emotions and feelings about how multifaceted this entire crisis is and how it affects our whole nation, how it affects families. You know, it's not, people tend to think that addiction just affects people who are homeless and it's just not that simple. You know, there are so many components to it. And so I really wanted to bring that out into the forefront and put a spotlight on that. And, um, and, and, yeah, just just I wanted to dedicate it to my brother because he's struggled so much. And I know so many have struggled and even people who who aren't addicted, but who have watched somebody be addicted. It is difficult and it, you feel very powerless and hopeless and helpless a lot of the time. And um, and I just wanted to to bring that out into the open and really spotlight some of the different aspects of the crisis that's still ongoing, unfortunately. Absolutely. Yeah. And you do such a good job really um, humanizing the epidemic. You know, there are so many people that have fallen victim to it that you wouldn't expect. You know, like you said, it's not, you know, just homeless people or, or, or you know, some of the stereotypical um, ideas that you might have about the opiate opioid epidemic. And so I think that that was very eye-opening for me. You know, I definitely learned a lot about the epidemic from reading this novel. So I really appreciated that about yeah, this not me thank you because that's that's exactly what i want to do you know you know yourself as an author you want to entertain your reader but maybe as a bonus maybe give them a new perspective and maybe be able to look at something from a new angle or or learn something new and yeah and addiction is such a it's a it's a struggle for all involved so that, that means a lot to me thank you oh, absolutely and then kind of veering right off of that i wanted to talk a little bit about research so this mm. It, it, it doesn't ever feel like an information dump, but when I really sat back and thought about it, you have included so much information. I mean, we have the opioid epidemic here, so there's a lot there that was new to me. But on top of that, we have a doctor, and there's a lot of a lot of talk about cancer research and cancer treatment. Yeah. And then we have the detective, who <laughs> the procedural part of being a detective. Um, yeah. It is never, you know, it's just their lives. All of this, all of this information and the research that you've so meticulously done just sort of flows out of them very <laughs> normally. You know, it's just in the conversations that they have and and the things that they express through their feelings. Um, but what's easy reading i know for a reader is a lot of work up front for an author so how much yeah. research and what kind of research did you put into this book before or as you were writing i did more research for this book than i've ever done for a book before <laughs> and that that is mostly because there's a lot of the the medical backdrop to it you know i i had a child who had leukemia who you know i don't i don't know a lot about leukemia i have never worked in the medical industry. So I did need to research that a, a lot and find out, you know, how how that works, what sort of treatments are available, how it works in children specifically. Um, and, and um, you know, so there were a lot of medical journals, a lot of, you know, sites like that. I also did speak to a doctor to get in actual information. Um, and while I was doing my research, I found out that there there is actually a treatment called CAR, CAR T-cell therapy. Um, that is used for you know children that that have leukemia, and it it costs it genuinely does cost between four hundred to five hundred thousand dollars, and it isn't covered by insurance because it isn't FDA approved. And when I found that out, I was like, well, that I need to include that. That you know when you do that sort of research and you find out things like that, it can absolutely go in your plot because you know if you have a child who's very sick right and then you find out that the treatment to save their life costs that much money and you can't get it what do you do you know so I, I wanted my the things that emma my protagonist does she does progressively get worse because she is on a corruption arc but i wanted my reader to understand her motivations and to understand you know she loves her son so much so do the ends justify the means right. so I, I did a lot of research in terms of the medical aspect first um, the opioid aspect, I did do some research, but I was quite aware of, a, of just because of my, my past, my history, 
with um with my own brother. I I was aware of quite a, a lot of different things for that, but then I did have to speak to a detective and speak to police officers and find out like what what, what is it like in the day of a life of a police officer? Can they actually go onto a drug task force? Do these things happen? I had a lot of questions, and um and I I had to do a lot of interviews and a lot of research in order to get those things really accurate and authentic. And then when I had finished the book, I sent it off to a doctor to make sure that that everything was accurate and authentic. You know, I even asked things like, okay, if you stab somebody in the stomach, where in the stomach do you have to stab them for them to live? And she must've been like, what? <laughs> no worries. <laughs> yeah, detailed stuff like that. Cause I wanted to make sure that everything was authentic and everything could actually happen the way that it did. Um, and again, this is this is a fiction book. It is made up, but I did want those aspects to come through and to shine through as authentic and genuine. So I I did do quite a lot of research, and even sometimes while I was writing, because I'm not really a plotter, I I write and then I'll go, oh wait, no, hold on. So that changes this other thing. So then I'll go back and I'll change it, and then I'll go forward. So I did a lot of back and you know two steps back, one step forward. And but when I was writing the story, I connected with it. And maybe it happens for you as well. I connected with this story more than I've ever connected with any story ever. And I wrote the first, just the first draft, but a draft in three months to the day. It just, once I had that research and information inside of me, it was like the characters in the story just blowed out of me. And I, w I really felt connected to that story. So I think doing that research ahead of time helped help that happen. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And I can just, I could get that sense, you know, your connection as an author with the story. I mean, it's just such a beautiful moving story, as I've said. And, mm -hmm. and I think that you as an author have to be so invested and so knowledgeable about the story for it to come across so just that well to the reader. Uh, going off being a, a pantser, I'm a pantser too. Um, so I, I get that, and I, I love being a pantser because you never really know, um, you know, what's going to happen when you get up and oh. sit down to write. You're not really sure what direction the story is going to take. But how much? Of the story, <laughs> obviously, without giving anything away. But how much of the story did you know when you, you know, on page one, did you know what your ending was going to be, or did you know all the things that Emma was going to do throughout the book, or did they just come with come to you as you wrote them? I knew with this story, so every book's a little bit different, but with this book, I knew that I was going to have a doctor who was going to do something crazy or do some crazy things <laughs> for a good reason. So I had my um, my protagonist, I had my character, and I knew that I wanted her to go on a negative, or not a, a corruption arc, so that meant that I got to know my character really quickly because I knew what her character arc was going to be. And I knew maybe the elevator pitch about what the plot was going to be. But that was it. I didn't know anything else. I just go, I sit down and I write it. And then, and then that means I have a lot of edits to do. <laughs> and I do a lot of editing as I go. And then, you know, I edit a million times. I read it a million times after that. But with this particular book, I did know, my character, my main character, the type of character arc she was going to go on, and I knew sort of that that like elevator pitch. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So all of your books, this is your third third novel, Do No Harm. Um, all of your books are they're deeply emotional. I mean, they're all they're tear jerkers. You know, I think <laughs> all of them, but they're thrilling. You know, they're such huge page turners. So how do you balance that when you're writing? Do you um, do you kind of uh, focus on plot and character the same, or do you put more of your efforts into one or the other? Hmm. That's a good question. I think it depends on the book. Every book is slightly different. Um, I I never really intended to make my books so emotional. You know, like they weren't, I think it was just maybe with this one in particular, it's the way that the character arc went and the things that needed to happen that made it very emotional. With The Night Olivia Fell, um, I think that one's a little bit different because it was my first book. And actually I wrote that book shortly after my father passed away. So I think there was a lot of grief in me. So that, that was kind of maybe coming out in that book. Um, Behind Every Lie isn't, isn't quite as emotional. It's more thrilling. So I think it depends on the book and going forward, my next books book and books that I'm writing. Um, I don't think they will always be that emotional. That's not really 
the goal isn't I'm not trying to be the, the the queen of tears right like I'm trying to thrill people and and just give them some sort of an escape and entertain them um but I think I do probably focus more on the character and then the plot develops around that character and and the choices because I really want to know my character and how that character is developing and create a, a you know a, a human like a that feels real to my reader and and really flesh them out and then some uh, quite a lot of the time once I know those things, the choices that they make start to develop the plot on its own. Right. Yeah. And character is just so important to a reader. You know, um, yeah. Lisa always says character is king. And I fully agree. Yeah. As a reader, you have to be so invested in invested. the character's lives yeah. to really, really care and want to see what happens to them at the end. And it doesn't yeah. mean that we have to agree with all the choices that, that yeah. they're making, but we just have to be so, you know, immersed in their story and really needing to know the outcome of of the book and and you nail yeah. it every single time so and i think understanding motivation as well and i think it's like that in real life you know we all have motivations for why we do things we don't make choices or or take actions in a vacuum we have a, a motivation behind it and so it's so important to understand and know our character well enough that that we know why they've done something not just that they've done something right Absolutely. So yeah. again, this is your third book. How has or has or how has your writing changed over the course of the three books that you've published so far? I know you're working on others, but just looking at these three, do you feel like your style has changed or your your speed of writing has changed? You know, what's evolved during that time? Definitely my speed of writing has changed. Um, I think that I with the night Olivia fell, actually, this is really funny because when I first started working on the night Olivia fell. I didn't even know that I wanted it to be a suspense slash thriller sort of a book. I was just working on a story, you know, and I wasn't very, I had worked on different genres and I'd worked on poetry when I was younger and short stories and romance. And, you know, I, I didn't know where my home was. And the more I worked on The Night Olivia Fell, um, the more it kind of, and then the more I, I edited it, the more I narrowed it down into that thriller suspense genre and and finding out the why why what happened to her you know that mystery I wanted to unravel that mystery and it made sense to me after I thought about it for a while because actually I like reading suspense and thrillers best why wouldn't I like writing them best you know so that made sense to me so then after I kind of figured that out then it, it was a lot easier to when as I read other books because when you're a writer you have to read other books to know what other authors do to know what works and what doesn't work so as I read other books I would kind of just inherently know where those plot points and where those beats were set and so it's become a bit easier for me to notice that and to do that just inherently as I write I kind of there just is a feeling like okay I need to have the 10% mark the inciting incident happens now you know, and then you write it. And so that has become a lot easier. Whereas with The Night Olivia Fell, I was definitely learning and learning my genre and learning dialogue. I mean, just learning everything and then putting it all together. And I think now that I know those things, it's just kind of working on my craft and hopefully perfecting it and making it better and make, e make each book um, more thrilling and more interesting for, for, for readers. Yeah, yeah, we're doing a great job at it. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw you have a journalism background, correct? It's, yeah, yeah. Cool. So I, I have a master's degree in journalism. Okay. And so how does that impact your fiction writing, do you think? Or does so, it? Yeah, it definitely does. I mean, you know, as a journalist, you have to work to really stringent deadlines. So that's that's prepared me for some deadlines. Um, but also as I was saying before, being a journalist, it helps me with understanding motivations. So when you interview somebody, you have to understand why they're saying the things they say because everybody has such a different perspective. So everybody has a different point of view. So you need to kind of understand, well, why did they see the, the, their story or their perspective this way and understand that in order to get your story factually correct. And so I think knowing that and learning that through journalism has really helped me in writing a story and, and creating characters and understanding that, you know, their, these characters that I create, their choices, their characteristics, their personalities, they come from maybe the way they were raised, from the sister or brother that they grew up with, from the type of parents that they had or didn't have. It comes from, you know, all of us and certainly in characters, um, it, it comes from our, our background. And so that, 
you know, being able to to see that and just look outside the box of it as a journalist um, has definitely helped me in creating characters that that are hopefully authentic and fleshed out as as you know real people. Right. Oh, oh my goodness, they are. They absolutely are. <laughs> Um, so you're in London now. You're from Seattle yeah. originally, correct? And the book is set in Seattle or just outside of Seattle in a fictional yeah. town, I believe, right? Yeah, totally made up. <laughs> so I guess this is two questions in one. Um, what brought you to London? And then also, why did you choose to set this book in Seattle? So I'll start with what, what brought me to London, which is quite a funny story. Um, many years ago, after I finished my undergraduate degree at the University of Washington, um, there were no jobs because September 11th had just happened and there were no jobs going. And I was like, what am I going to do with my life? So I worked for a little bit, saved up some money and I went traveling and I ended up in London Heathrow. I'd taken a, a night flight and I, I ended up in London and I stumbled off of the plane and I was so tired. I was delirious. And I stumbled into the arrivals hall and I was like, I hadn't even booked a hotel room. Like, I, like you know, you know the way you do when you're like in your early 20s. And I was just not organized at all. And so I was like, hmm, what should I do? And I staggered over to an Aer Lingus desk and I bought a ticket to Dublin right then, like just. <laughs> <laughs> took a flight to Dublin and then I went on this tour all around Ireland and it was and while I was doing it I um I went to this town called Galway and I loved it and it turned out that in Galway there was a um, university there that had a master's degree in journalism and I decided to apply <laughs> and I got accepted and so a few months later after I'd gone back home I I let I like sold all of my stuff and I just left and I moved to Ireland and while I was in Ireland I met my future husband and he's from England. So then we eventually moved to England. So, you know, going to London was kind of getting off that flight in London was like a sliding doors moment for me, because if I hadn't gotten that flight onto Ireland, I wouldn't have met my husband and my life would be very different. So that's, that's a long story of how I ended that's up. That's a good story. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a very fun story. And then, um, but I'm not sure why I set my books around the Seattle area. I think it's it's just because it's it's home, you know, like it's still home to me and it's still so familiar. And I love the nostalgia of writing and, and also Washington State. It's so rich in atmosphere. There's so many things to see and do. There's water and mountains and forests. And, you know, there's so much that adds to a story because I love atmosphere in a story so I love writing it as well and I think I think because Washington State is so diverse like that you can just add so much to the story atmosphere is like another character almost you know so I think that's why I do but I'm not 100% on that. <laughs> well, the atmosphere in the book is, it's so strong. You know, when you describe this mill that they visit a few times in the novel, and, you know, I could just feel it. And it's just, you know, there's this ominous feeling kind of lurking yeah. throughout the whole book. And like you said, it sort of is another character. And I just, yeah. I've been to Seattle just once or twice, but I just, I love the area. And I, you know, it, it has um, sort of that, you know, it rains so much there and you do, yeah. sort of that, you know, even if you're not familiar, even if you haven't been to Seattle, you've just heard of Seattle. I think that we all sort of have this idea of Seattle and what the weather is like. And I just yeah. feel like you you get that across kind of that um, yeah. in the book. And it it just adds so much to the tension of the novel, aside from everything else that's going yeah. on. So that, that was incredible. Thank you. Um, so you, your last book, um, Behind Every Lie, came out. It was was it February of last year. So yeah, so yeah, one year ago. before the pandemic. Yeah. And yeah, now, releasing it right before. Well, yeah. we knew about it. Everything was all starting to ramp up. Right. Behind every light came out. So right. yeah. And so now you're releasing. I mean, I'm sure you when when that book came out, I'm sure you thought this would be done by the time. I did not. I, I was thinking. In fact, because behind every lie, I really wanted to go for conferences and stuff over the summer, and I wanted to meet all these amazing authors that I've talked to, and and I just thought. Oh, I can't believe this is still going on because I thought for sure 2021 will be the year I get to meet everybody. But right. <laughs> it's like 2022. Yeah, 2022. <laughs> um, so what is it like? I mean, you know, I I had a book out last February, so I'm I'm um you know familiar, but but tell everybody else what is it really like, you know, trying to release and publicize a book right now during the pandemic. Um, I feel like maybe it's getting 
not easier to publicize, but there was a time where you definitely, you know, things were just so grim. You didn't want to be going on social media and like broadcasting your new book. That sort of felt like in poor taste. Yeah. But what yeah. Is it like? You know, what have the challenges been? Have there been any positive aspects to, you know, this more virtual format that we are experiencing now? So a year ago with Behind Every Lie, it definitely felt a lot more grim back then and a lot more like, oh, I can't talk about this right now. I mean, you know, the world is so messed up and there's so much just trauma, you know, it was just really hard to talk about. And I wasn't even reading. I, how could I expect anybody else to read? But but now it's it feels a bit more hopeful. You know, we have a vaccine and hopefully the world will be looking up pretty soon. Um, as far as publicizing the book, I think it's definitely different, but I wasn't really releasing books at a time when I was going to conferences and 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 going on book tours, you know, physically going on book tours. So to be honest, this is this is kind of what I know. So it is fine to me. And in a way, it's actually quite good because I feel like I get to speak to so many more people like all around the world, no matter where somebody is, you know, if, if they're in London or Scotland or in India or in Texas, I can still get online and, and speak to you or to anybody, you know, just, just virtually. And I think that that's been such a lifesaver, you know, doing Facebook lives and Instagram lives and meeting so many of the readers, you know, just, just face to face in these, these chats and answering their questions live. I think it's been a real gift. And I think that um, even, even if, you know, we go back to in-person conferences, which I definitely hope we do, I, I do hope that some of these virtual aspects will stay because I think that having a virtual presence gives so much more access for readers to authors and authors to readers. And I think it's incredibly fun. <laughs> Yeah, I completely agree. You know, I did I did manage to get like a little tour in last year before the, mm -hmm. the real lockdown began. But there's, you know, you can only connect with so many readers when you're visiting X number of stores. Right. So if you're on a yeah. virtual platform, like you said, you can connect to readers basically Everybody. anywhere. Yeah. 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 I'm really curious, you know, both with writing and outside of writing, how life is permanently changed because of all of this. I, even my husband who works in human resources, but I wonder, you know, and he hasn't been back to work yet, but I wonder, will he ever be going back to five days a week? I don't know. They've realized that there are so many things that can be done from home virtually that maybe they don't yeah. need to be in the office. Yeah. I do think that people are maybe a little bit more productive working from home. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but just from what I've heard from a lot of my friends, but but I do think that there are some industries that just inherently need to to be physically present. So maybe some industries will work from home, home more, some won't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I have just a couple more questions and then I think we're gonna open it up for any audience questions, but cover and title, oops. Which hmm. um, okay, is this the, was this your working title, Do No Harm, or did it change? And is this the first cover you saw or were there covers before this that you saw? So the the, the title is the first title that I've ever suggested that didn't change. <laughs> so usually uh, there's like, you know, 10 working titles that happen and it, it goes through so many, you know, from the editor to the, to the marketing team, the sales team. So it goes through a lot of changes. Um, and so I kind of started going, okay, working title and then writing the book. <laughs> but, but for this one, I was like, well, you know, do no harm because the Hippocratic Oath, it's right in there in the book, right? She's a doctor. So I put that in as a suggestion and my editor loved it instantly. And so it just stuck the whole time. So this, this, this was the title from the very beginning. And that's just, and I think that it really works like just because it inherently is about doctors. Yeah. Um, the cover changed a number of times actually initially it was first kind of like um like like the top half kind of had like the top of a little boy with some red boots and it was a gorgeous cover but i felt like it wasn't really thrillery enough if that makes sense i know thrillery isn't a word but i'm gonna make it <laughs> <We don't. laughs> thrillery um, it wasn't kind of like tense and dark enough so i was like can we do something with you know like either the the warehouse or you know just something a little bit darker and then we got this um which i love and it's changed sort of color the color palette was a bit different at first it was more green and then then we moved to more of like this sort of burnt sienna sort of color which i love mm -hmm. um and i just love it because you know we have this this you know mill warehouse mill at the background which is like 
so prominent in the book, right? Like <laughs> so much happens at this place. So I really love the the direction that we went, but it, it did change a few times first. Yeah. Okay. And I think, I mean, it's perfect. I absolutely love it. It's so eye-catching. I love the colors and it just speaks so much to the mood. <laughs> Of the book and you know events that are happening with yeah yeah I love it and I you did a fun thing on your social media where you post <laughs> yourself like like Emma here on the cover and ask did yeah. we just think it was you and yes. honestly I mean it could have been you know I <laughs> know it's awesome I but I <laughs> love you. <laughs> That day, I just happened to be wearing that on pub day. I happened to be wearing an outfit that looked very much <laughs> like that. And yeah. my coat that I wear is like a long wool jacket. And um, and so I was like, oh, here, babe, take a picture of me holding this up. <laughs> and so we did. And it was hilarious just how much like me it looked like from the background with my hair kind of tied back. So much, so much. So if you're so if you're um, not already following Christina on social media, go check it out. I think it was on Instagram yeah. and Facebook both. So yeah, um, and it was on yeah. February 16th. So scroll back a little ways and just check. It's so funny. <laughs> So funny. So my last question for you, and then we're going to open it up, I think, for questions, but is, um, are you working on a new book? You don't have to tell us uh, what it's about, because I know that's always such an awkward question for writers, especially pantsers, when they're getting started. Um, yeah. Or even when they're putting right through, you know, and don't even know where this book is going yet. But I'm curious if you're writing, and what is it like writing right now? Because I know you've got two kids, young, they're pretty young, right? And yeah. are they remote school or homeschool? Yeah, homeschool. Seven-year-old and a 12-year-old. And the the 12-year-old, he kind of, he mostly does everything himself, you know, virtually. Um, but my seven-year-old, you know, he's seven. He needs, you know, constant engagement. <laughs> I have to teach him math and I have to teach him English. And, um, and it, you know, it's, it's a day. It's a job. Like, I'm doing that as my job now. So... Um, I am, I do write, I am writing, I am always writing, but I did realize back at the beginning of the pandemic that if I was ever going to get anything written at all, that I was going to have to carve out a slice of time for myself completely separate from my family or from homeschooling or any of that stuff. So I started waking up between five and six in the morning and I'm not a morning person. Now I know you get up really early, <laughs> but I'm not a morning person. So this was really hard. So I was getting up at like five to six in the morning and I would roll out of bed and I did not allow myself any social media or news or anything like no phone allowed, just me, my cup of tea and my laptop. And I just wrote and, um, and it was a very, it was a very difficult time actually, because like you at the very beginning of the pandemic, I really couldn't think very well. Like I couldn't focus on reading. I couldn't, it was, it was difficult. So, um, but I did write and I kept writing and I'm still writing and it's, it's slow going, but you know, I think it taught me that I think if we really want to do something enough, we will make it work. So I'm still here. I'm still writing. <laughs> and I think every single one of us, when whenever you finish that next book, we're dying to read it. So, Thank you. Uh, so yeah. So just, I, I love chatting with you, all of you out there. If you haven't already purchased a copy of Do No Harm, do it. I know Murder by the Books has signed book plates, correct, to go out in their copies. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Signed them. I've signed them all. <laughs> We do have them and we would appreciate the support for sure. Um, so we have a question from Amy. I'm going to pop it up on the screen and read it. Without giving anything away, did the ending of this book ever change during the writing process or was it always the same? So the ending was always the same. I did not know the ending before I wrote it, but when I wrote it, it it meant so much to me and it resonated with me so much because of the character arc that Emma was going through. And I really want to tell you guys about it and tell and talk to you all about it, but I'm not going to spoil it. <laughs> but one day I will have a spoiler sort of book club chat and we'll talk all about the ending. Um, but right, that day is not today. <laughs> so I can't tell you about the ending, but it didn't change. It was always, it just, I, I wrote it and it fit and I just loved it so much that I didn't change it. Fair enough, okay. Um, so Carla asked if you're already working on a new book but we just went through that. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna- I'm always say, working on a new book. <laughs> Carla, that one's been answered. She asked it before, before your last question. Okay, Margaret was wondering, do you use a particular software program to assist with your writing? 
I use a very old fashioned software called Word, <laughs> Microsoft <laughs> Word, and that is it. <laughs> How about um, you, Mary? Oh, I'm sorry, I go ahead. Too. I, I hear so many I authors raving about Scrivener, um, but I've never yeah. tried it. Ask anybody in my home, anytime you know, we get yeah. a new remote control or anything, I'm just like incapacitated. So yeah. Word works. If it's working, I'm not going to mess yeah. with it. <laughs> yeah, I really I really want to, to try Scrivener, but then I feel like I'll get confused with trying to learn how it works in order to lay things out. And because I'm not a plotter, it might not work for me anyway. So then what's the point of spending the time? So I just, I am I use Word. <laughs> Clearly, if it's not broke, don't fix it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, the always fabulous, multiple award-winning author, Hank Phillippe Ryan, is also joining us. And um, she was wondering, do you have, do you have fun writing or is it step-by-step -step crawling? What's the most <laughs> difficult part? That's such a good question. That's a great question. Um, I love writing. It is my favorite part of the whole process. I hate editing because especially in this genre, I think it feels like, you know, you've built a, a house of cards and if you take out one thing, then everything falls apart. And so that feels really complicated to me. But the writing aspect of just pure creativity, just getting up and getting to my laptop and creating a whole story Every day it's something new and it's exciting. And sometimes I get so emotionally invested. Some days I cry, you know, not very often because I'm not a big crier. But if there's anything that's going to make me cry, it's probably when I'm, you know, while I'm writing. Um, but sometimes I laugh, you know, sometimes I just, <clears throat> I love my characters and I just get to know them. And, you know, so I love that. I don't ever feel like it's a crawl. Um, the part that feels like a crawl is, is editing and also the publishing process is really slow. <laughs> so that always feels like, hurry up. <laughs> what about you, Mary? I, I do, I love writing. Um, I, it's so fun. Um, there are definitely, you know, days or even some books that feel more like a job, you know, they, they yeah, just yeah. give me a little bit more trouble than others do. Um, and I don't know why, you know, I never know yeah, what they're all different. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't know why some books just flow so smoothly and others yeah. kind of resist me. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I love what I do. I feel so fortunate all the time that I can be able to do something I love for a living. And because I am, you know, an early bird, I'm up at five in the morning. I mean, I honestly mean it when I say that there are nights that I go to bed and I'm so excited, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that I get to get up in, you know, eight hours or whatever and write. Yeah. No, I'm the same. Sometimes some of those mornings when I had to get up at five and like I said, I'm not a morning morning person, but I would be like looking forward to getting up because then you get that day with your characters and that story. And yeah, I find it really exciting and fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Um, so Katie has a question and I know you've already touched on this, Christina, but maybe we can also get some thoughts from Mary. Have you found that during the pandemic you've been more productive with your writing or more distracted? And I know homeschooling clearly has to be a, a tough thing with that, but you yeah. want to elaborate anymore? That's a really good question. So I, I've definitely been less productive, but that's more because of the time constraints, I think. What I found is that I'm a lot more self-disciplined because I have to be. So I, I set out time for writing and then I have my time for homeschooling and then I have my time for making dinner and laundry and all that, you know, stuff that I have to do. And then I have my time for doing like author interviews and, and marketing and, and stuff like that for the evening. So I have to be really regimented about the way that I organize my time. It's not something I love. I don't love my life being like that. It's just the, simply the way it is. So um, my my kids are going back to school at the end of next week. Yay! So hopefully <laughs> I can get back to just feeling like I have one job instead of 12. <laughs> um, I've, I've, I haven't ever felt less motivated, um, just definitely less productive, which makes me feel really frustrated. But it is the way it is. And I'm trying to focus on the things that I can control right now, which are basically um, my children's mental health and my own mental health and just trying to make this year be something that maybe our family doesn't look back on and go, oh, I hate that year my mom taught me, you know, you know what I mean? Like, just try to make the best of it, I think. And it's not always great, but it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Mary? I've definitely been less productive. Um, you know, for me, I think it's, it's, the noise in the house and my yeah. kids are older, they're 13 and 15. So they really are pretty independent when it comes to school. 
But um, I'm one of those people, I really like quiet to write. I like to just okay. lose myself in my books and in the lives of my characters. And um, there's just, there's more noise in the house. There's, you know, some sort of interruption all the time. You know, somebody got kicked off the internet or, you know, <laughs> somebody needs something <laughs> through me. And, <laughs> and it's not a lot, but it's just that <laughs> constant like, pulling me out of my manuscripts that's been a struggle. Um, yeah. I was pretty fortunate or I felt very fortunate that I had turned in my next release, Local Woman Missing, just as the pandemic was beginning. So I was working on revisions for kind of the first half of it, which requires like a different brain than that creative drafting yeah. stage. So that was something that I could do pretty easily while dealing with the distractions. You know, I would just focus on whatever the task was for that day. And it was different than trying to, you know, draft something from scratch. But since that's all been done you know the the actual writing of the next book is very <laughs> slow going <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's getting there though <laughs> um since you mentioned it i always like when we have a guest moderator to give you a chance to talk a little bit about what you have coming out um will you tell us a little bit about local woman missing yeah, I'd love to. So Local Woman Missing will be out in May, May 18th. And it's set in um, a suburban Chicago town where over the course of a couple weeks, two women and one little girl go missing. And there's an investigation into the disappearances, which eventually goes cold. Um, and then 11 years later, this little girl who's now 17 years old, she suddenly returns and just kind of opening up all new questions, like where has she been all this time and where are the others and are these disappearances connected? And so I'm really, I'm really excited for that one. And um, yeah, it'll be here just a couple more months. I can't wait. Excellent. As I said, um, we have links in the comments if you're interested in pre-ordering that one. And um, I'm hoping we'll be back talking with you about that in May. Um, Sadly, still virtually, but you know, as you said, there's there's pros and cons to that at this point. We certainly um, have enjoyed having people watch these events from all over the world. Yeah. Um, so we have some more questions. I just need to find one. Okay, um, Jay was wondering, have either of you thought about whether you'll include the pandemic in a future book? Oh, such a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I've been hoping that my editor will just tell me what to do at some point because I just don't know. Like I did a I did a poll on my Facebook page and I asked readers what they wanted if they wanted a pandemic to show up in future books. And 98% of people said, no, I don't even want to think about it. Let's just pretend like it's not here. Like I'm living it. Why do I want to read it? Um, but a few did say yes, like, you know, the, the, it's the reality. So if you said it in either of these years, last year or this year, then you need to include it at least in passing. So I don't know. I think it'll have to, at the point when my next book is about to come out, it will have to be taken up with the powers that be above me. <laughs> <laughs> It's, I think right now we're, I mean, because we're living it, it's so close to home that the yeah. idea, you know, I feel like our books are kind of our safe place, you know, where we can yeah. sort of leave this, the struggles of, you know, our everyday lives behind and kind of join in the worlds of our characters. So for me right now, I have, I have no interest in including that, yeah. you know, and it'll be, you know, it, it's something that I'm going to have to kind of reckon with because it is part of the world. You know, if I'm setting a book in 2020 or 2021, there's yeah. got to be some sort of mention, you know, otherwise something feels yeah. wrong there. So, so I'm not really sure how, how I will address that, but right now my answer I think would be no, that I would not want to write about the pandemic. My uh, unsolicited uh, advice is to leave it out, given my <laughs> readers overwhelmingly would probably be 98% also as far as customer yeah. base. Unless it, unless it involves, um, unless you have a strict timeline in your book, you could actually leave it out and people wouldn't, we would assume the book was set in 2019, you know, and like, it would be fine. But um, it also has, you know, if you want to include the fact that they couldn't recognize a face because someone's wearing a mask, like there's <laughs> there's some unique things that could be plot points that are <laughs> pandemic related. But um, aside, from the, <laughs> <laughs> aside from that, I think it would make a lot of challenges. I know um, we have so many customers right now who are more so than ever reading for escape, escape books, yeah. classics. Um, and it's just, I understand like wanting to include veracity in the books, but also like people are needing that escape right now. So it's interesting. Yeah. It's always an interesting question. Um, okay. And uh, also a pandemic related question. Do you think the pandemic lockdown has hurt or improved the book industry, meaning our book purchases higher, same or lower? Oh, um, 
I think certain books like um, classic books, um, authors who have a huge brand already, those I think from what I can see are doing quite well. And then authors who don't have maybe a very great platform or maybe struggling a little bit more to, to break out into the noise because there's so much noise going on and people want something safe, you know? So they go, they reach for a book that is a classic or that they already know that, that author. Um, whereas, you know, newer authors are struggling a bit more. Um, but that's just what I'm seeing. I could be wrong. I'm not sure. What do you think, Mary? I, I feel like I've seen um, articles that do say that book sales are up and McKenna, you would know more about that than me, but um, I've just seen some headlines like that. I do agree that yeah. it depends, you know, that that doesn't, yeah, every single author is selling. Right. Books, so it <laughs> depends on the visibility um, of the books and that kind of thing. And from the readers that I spoke to, it's been interesting because it's like 50 50 as to whether people are reading more or reading less, you know, just depending yeah. on where they are mentally and emotionally during all of this. You know, I know it's so yeah. hard to focus, but yeah. just, you know, too, do they have little kids at home that they're trying to homeschool all day and do they have the time to read? So it's kind yeah. of hit or miss. Yeah, I mean, we have customers who are reading um, around the clock and we have customers who haven't read a book in a year and they normally read three in a week. So um, yeah. I, my experience talking to customers is the same. My experience with myself and the staff is the same. Some people are reading like crazy and I read very little compared to normal last year. Um, part of it's just the time demands and um, schedule readjustments and workload and all of that. But it, yeah. It's fascinating. I would also agree that it's very, very, very hard, especially last year, to launch a book, like to launch a debut, yeah. to get the kind of media coverage that's normal. And also um, the whole marketing and publicity side of the book industry has had to adapt immediately to no yeah. tours, um, all of that kind of stuff. So um, it's been it's been a crazy, crazy adventure. Um, I'm looking for a little normalcy <laughs> coming yeah. soon. But um Anyway, that's that's what I see. I think that it's I think that people are reading a lot, but I think you're right. Like we've sold hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Agatha Christie books in this time. And yeah. it's a, a known know. yeah. A known quantity. They don't want um, something uncertain. So anyway, okay. Um, mm -hmm. next question. Being thriller writers, do either of you ever find yourself creeped out by your research? Hmm. No, I mean, I have this <laughs> quite weird research. Um, I've never been creeped out by it. You know, I wouldn't um, watch a horror movie. I just, I don't like horror books or horror movies or just any horror stuff. But then I like to write that sort of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> creepiness and, and atmosphere. Um, but I've never been creeped out by what I write. And I think a lot of that is because as a writer, you're very much in control of, of everything. Like you control how scared you want to be. You, you can just walk away from it. And because you are you are your book's god, <laughs> then, you know, you are in control of it. And you, why would you be scared of what you can control? <laughs> I um I feel like I've always I always learn something in the research that yeah. I do. I'm, I'm so guilty of falling down this rabbit hole of research and just like discovering all these things that are never gonna answer my right now. <laughs> it's so easy to do. So I feel like I, I learn so much from every book I write, just in the research that I do. I have not been creeped out. I don't think maybe some of the locations that are if they're based mm -hmm. on a real place, you know, the more that I that I write read about things that happen in that location, that can kind of yeah. give me the EBGBs. But um, but it's more fascination than scared. I think too with yeah. the writing process is, you know, we write a lot slower than somebody reads the book. So sometimes it's so much about like word choice and, you know, it might take days to finish a chapter that a reader reads in 10 minutes. So yeah. sometimes we think because it's a little slower pace for us, it's maybe we don't quite lose ourselves in the emotion of it as we're writing. I feel like that emotion always hits me after I finish the book and go back for a reread. That's when I feel, you know, the connection and scared and all of those things um, yeah. from my book. Yeah. Okay. So um, we have one more crowd question and then I'm going to close with my own question. Um, so Shannon is wondering, do you find that writing typically energizes or exhausts you? 
It depends on the day. <laughs> um, you know, it depends on the day. It depends on the scene that I've written. If it's been a really emotional scene, I do feel quite exhausted afterwards. But if it's one of those kind of like, you know, towards the end of the book, you'll start getting closer and closer to that big fight or that big climax that you've got, then that's really energizing. And it's like, ah, and I'm just typing like crazy, just trying to get it out of my head. So in that way, um, I think a bit of both. And it just depends on the day and the scene and and the characters that are involved. Yeah, I think it's um it's the same for me and that it that it varies. And usually it's about just how well the words are flowing. You know, if it's yeah. a day where I feel super productive and I'm full of ideas and like yeah. you said, just typing as fast as I possibly can, like I can't take fast enough to keep up with the words in my head. That is super energizing. But then there are days that like two hours pass and I've written a hundred words. You know, that's exhausting when 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 that happens. So it, it definitely depends on the day. Yeah. Okay, so my question, just because I'm fascinated by this, is what books did you read in your formative years? And did you um, did you read a certain book that made you think, I want to be a writer? So when I was a kid, I, I've i always been a huge bookworm. So I used to go to the library. I begged my mom to go to the library and I would take home stacks and stacks of books. And in fact, when I was about 10 years old, our house caught on fire and we had to move out of the house for a while. And we moved into a, a really tiny little motor home and it was the middle of the winter and we didn't have any heating. And so my mom would take us every day after school to the library. And it sounds like that should be a really traumatic experience, but actually it's a really good memory because I got to spend every day after school in the library. And so I read everything. I read um, Betsy, Tacey and Tib. I, I read Sweet Valley Twins and Sweet Valley High. I read Babysitter's Club. I mean, Nancy Drew, Hardy Bo Boys. Oh, you, you name a book and I probably read it <laughs> when I was a kid. So it very much like shaped me and and the reader that I currently am. And then also that I, you know, I just knew even back then that I wanted to write. And um, and so I'd come home and I would read these books and and then I would even write stories for my sisters. You know, when I was my first story that I ever wrote was about these, it was called The Girls with the Golden Hair. My sisters and I are all blonde. And so we all in the story and in real life wanted sweets. We wanted chocolate. That was our goal. That was our story goal. We couldn't get it because we were too poor. So we learned one day that our hair was actually real gold. So we cut our hair and took it to the bank <laughs> and got money for it and then bought lots of sweets. So obviously I had a lot to learn <laughs> about writing stories. No, that sounds like a bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, the, I think the point is that I've always wanted, I've always been a reader and that has kind of led me to being a writer as well. And, and that's all happened from just spending a lot of time in libraries and with books and yeah. So I've read everything. <laughs> oh, I love that. Um, they, I, I grew up in the library, so we didn't have a fire, but I just, I feel like you know, all my afternoons, I'd go to the library, I'd bring a big bag with me and just basically any books that I could stuff in that bag to bring home, I would. Um, I read a lot of the thing, same things as you, Christina, uh, Nancy Drew, Babysitter's Club, the Sweet Valley <laughs> High books. Um, I think two of my favorite when I was younger are um, by Natalie Babbitt, The Eyes of the Amaryllis and Tuck Everlasting. Those were ones that I just, I read again and again, I remember teaching teachers reading to them them to us when I was in elementary school and are just reading them with my mother. I just loved those books and they're more supernatural than anything I write. They definitely have those mystery elements in them. And I think that that was something that I gravitated to, you know, even at a young age. Yeah. Wonderful. I always love asking that question because no matter who starts talking about reading in their childhood, they get like the kind of real smile that like causes little crinkles at their eyes and like a twinkle, like, like everyone gets it's this like good energy talking about the books they read as kids. So um, both of you, both of you um, answered beautifully. I love, I love hearing those stories. So, um, okay, I guess that's it for today. I just wanted to mention again that we have signed book plates um, and copies of Do No Harm. Um, and if you'd like to, obviously we have Mary's books that are in print in stock, but if you'd like to pre-order her May release, uh, Local Woman Missing, you can do so. It's in the link um, in the comments. Thank you both so much um, for joining me this afternoon.
It's yes, such an honor to be here. And Mary, it's been so nice to e-meet you. <laughs> well, I loved the book. I loved chatting with you. Thank you so much for having us here, McKenna. This has been a blast. Thank you. It, it, it was a blast for me too. And I'm going to um, sign us all off. Y'all have a great rest of the day. And thanks again. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.